see all 10 of those killer whale types. Now, the ones that you see on the left are the ones that we are likely to see in our part of the world, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, they are called types A, B, or Big B, Little B, or, or uh, the Gerlash killer whale, type C, which was in that first photo with the ice, and then type D, which is a, a fairly elusive, hard to find subantarctic type. Now, if you look at this poster, you would think there's only 10 types. But in fact, there's probably more because as you can see, there's no tropical killer whale mentioned there. And, in, and the, the killer whales that we see around Australia, um, we think may also be different in, in comparison to the Antarctic. They look Sorry. like Antarctic type A's, but we think in Australia, we might have something a bit special and it might even be shared with New Zealand. And that might be another talk we can do another time and invite one of our guests to come across and have a talk about that. So today, Dave, Dave, can I interrupt? How, how large are these guys? So this is, what, this is what the next slide is all about. So what you'll see in the next slide is a familiar picture. These are Australian killer whales. These are, are two juvenile killer whales that were seen off Western Australia in an area called Bremer Bay or Bremer Canyon region in the sub-basin. Now they do look a lot like Antarctic killer whales, but some things that we know are a, bit, are a bit different is that Australian killer whales grow to a length of about seven to eight meters for the boys and a bit smaller for the girls. So in dolphins and whales that have teeth, the adult males are almost always in every species larger than the females. But if we talk about something like a humpback whale, the opposite is true. The females are larger than the males when they grow up. So to give you an idea of how big killer whales in Australian waters are, I'm gonna show you the next slide, which is a picture of me squatting down next to the skull of, a, of an Australian killer whale. And there it is there. So as you can see, this skull is standing on its end. If you can imagine sitting inside a killer whale's mouth and looking up, you'd be looking at where the teeth would normally be. All those little black holes are where the teeth were originally. So the killer whale's um, skull, we don't know if this is a female or a male, it's pretty much the same size as me when I squat down. And I'm six foot four, so I'm fairly tall. Um, so you can get an idea of just how big this is. So I'm thinking that my niece would probably be smaller than this killer whale skull. That's telling you a little bit about how big killer whales are in Australian waters. So they're like, they're about the size of a, a, a 22 seater bus or something like that. Yeah, around about, yeah, a bit, maybe a bit smaller, but certainly their cousins that look like them in the Antarctic um, would certainly be about that size. Yeah. So, so anyway, Dave, I've got a question from Regis who's asking, what does the top fin do? That's a very good question. What does the top fin do? Well, the fins on all whales and dolphins um, help the animal to control its body temperature. So what we call thermoregulating. So keeping those blood vessels cooler, uh, much like in how a seal does it in its flipper. If you've ever seen a seal at sea, they often have their flippers raised above the water to catch the wind and cool their, their blood and therefore call it cooling their body. So that's one function. There's a, other functions have to do with balance in the water. And as far as we know, but for male killer whales, which have very, very, very tall dorsal fins, maybe up to six foot tall and maybe even taller in some other types. It's a form of um, perhaps alpha male, like a big, big dog or a big sea seal. They all have these features which make them look big and nasty and strong um, and perhaps dominant. And we think that that might be one of the functions of the very, very tall dorsal fin of the so male. Dave, Dave, I've got a couple of other questions here as well. One is from Ayla and I might un unmute you, Mandy. Um, because Ayla has asked the question, is this the ICI Care meeting tonight? <laughs> hey guys, so it's actually not an ICI Care. I can see lots of my ambassador names up there. So hi everyone. Um, it's not actually an ICI Care. This is just Dolphin Research Institute doing some general education, but there will be lots of ICI Care things coming up in the near future. So you will find out about those from your coordinator teachers. They will email your parents to all the information. Okay, thank you. Now, oh, Dave, there's God. another question about how much do these big dolphins and killer whales weigh? 
Yeah, and that's a good point. And we didn't, it does say it in the title, but I must admit, I forgot to say so, the killer whales are in fact dolphins. They are the biggest of all the dolphins, um, particularly those in the Northern Hemisphere, which are quite a bit bigger than ours. Um, so they are the biggest dolphin. We, the, the weight depends on whether or not it's a full grown male or female, but it could be up to around about six or seven ton, depending on the, the size of the animal. Um, so that's quite large, that's quite a heavy animal. And I've got a photo which I can show you next, if you like, with some people standing next to some stranded killer whales, which I went to a stranding. So a stranding is when whales and dolphins end up on a beach where they shouldn't be. And that can happen for a number of reasons, and we often don't know the reason. But in this case, these animals, were, we were able to get them off the sandbank and back into the water. So the ones you see in that photo right there all survived, including the calf, which I don't know if you can see it, but it's underneath the green tent between the two big animals. There's a little calf sitting in there, a baby. So a calf is um, a baby killer whale or a baby whale or dolphin. Now these are all females, except the one in the background. Um, so the one, that's not a full grown male, but the one you see closest with the person standing next to you is a full grown female Australian killer whale, possibly linked to the tropical groups. And you can see someone standing up next to it. That gives you an idea of just how big uh, Australian killer whales are. So quite an impressive animal. So Dave, I've got another question. Since you talk about the little calf, how long do killer whales stay pregnant? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, I did read once thir about 12 to 13 months. Um, I'm not sure if that was only known from captivity. I'd have to do the research on that. So please do send us a message at Dolphin Research Institute's uh, Facebook page and I will get back to you with an accurate answer on that. Thank you. That's a great question. I see another one. Why are they called killer whales? That's a very good question. Okay. And why am I calling them killer whales today is another question. Some people call killer whales orca. Um, other people call them orca whales. Now, killer whales um, is the most commonly accepted common name. Now, for those of you who joined us last time, we talked about common names a little bit, and we're going to talk about it again now. So killer whales is a very well globally accepted reference for these animals, which it, it includes all 10 groups that we saw. Um, orca is the species part of the scientific name. And the scientific name is Orsinus orca. Now, the reason we've chosen not to call them orca is because some of the work that's coming through now from scientists who are much smarter than me, uh, who work in genetics, suggests that perhaps not too distant future, we might be looking at more than one, maybe even more than two or three species or subspecies of killer whale. So that name orca will be applied to perhaps one or two species or subspecies, but won't be the term that we would use for all of the types of killer whale anymore. So we're, we think we're trying to get ahead of the game in that one. Um, now, the reason they're called killer whales is because of the way in which they hunt. They are quite uh, aggressive animals when they hunt, and they're a bit like um, a pride of lions when they hunt. It's mostly the females and young males that do the hunting with the calves uh, accompanying them. And they work as a group, so they rely on each other. They're much like a very tight family unit. They are socially very complex and they require, they almost require each other to survive. Um, they eat all sorts of things which require more than one animal to be able to take it down and kill it. So if you've ever seen um, a documentary on lions, just next time you watch one, picture them as killer whales and you might be able to envisage just what a killer whale hunt looks like. If you're lucky enough, you might get to see one in real time one day at sea. Or better still watch a documentary on killer whales. So yes, it's a really this? good one. A really good killer whale documentary called Wolves of the Sea, which my friend filmed um, many, many years ago. If you, if you can get access to Wolves of the Sea, that's a great film and a great story. Um, so Dave, what about the photographs on this slide? Exactly um, right. So what we've got here is a group of individual killer whales. Now, none of these individuals, actually I tell a lie, two of them are related. This group of killer whales are showing us how to tell the difference between one animal from another. Now with killer whales, it's very similar to other dolphins in that we use the dorsal fin 
um, as a reference to identify an individual person, uh, individual killer whale, just like an individual human. So I've got green eyes and I've got a shaved head. Jeff has a beard and he's, I can't remember his eye color. Um, and he looks different, much like all you guys look different. Now that's easy for us to tell the difference, but with killer whales and other dolphins, it's a little bit trickier. So what you see here, what I've given you here is um, some very good examples of easily identifiable animals. So going from the top on the left, we have split fin. Now split fin has been known to us since 2005. She is an adult female and we believe that her fin was damaged by a propeller of a boat, uh, the two slices, and you can see her fin has flopped over. So she's got a very obvious name. The one in the middle there, is his her name sorry is groovy she's also an adult female and she's not related to split fin as a family group though might be more broadly to the right of groovy is slice fin and slice fin is related to the next animal and his name is ripley coming across from ripley to the right is a very well known animal his name is scar now i'll tell you a quick story about scar um, and this will help you understand just how hard it is to, to find killer whales. The reason we can't study them um, doing research in our boat at the Dolphin Research Institute or with Killer Whales Australia is we never know where they're going to be. It's so hard to find them. They're very lucky in Western Australia because they've got animals that gather for several weeks, perhaps even several months, and makes them easier to, um, to, to study, whereas our guys are always moving. So this photo taken... Um, back in 2009 by a friend of mine, John Poyner, you can see his name on the photograph, um, was taken at a place called Naruma. That's in New South Wales, southern New South Wales to be precise, near where the fires have been recently. Now, 13 days later, uh, Scar, sorry, Scar was photographed in Warrnambool, which is in Western Victoria. Now, just before we came online today, I did some quick maths. Now, where did I write it down? Here we go. He traveled 879 kilometers in 13 days. Now that's assuming that he traveled in a straight line, which he probably didn't, and took the shortest way you could possibly go by sea, which he probably didn't. So it's more likely to be more kilometers than that, perhaps a close to a thousand. So if it is only 879, that's 67 kilometers per day that animal traveled with his two friends. Um, and you know what they were doing when they got to Warrnambool? They were attacking southern right whales. Um, they didn't kill one, but they certainly did attack them. So that gives you a little bit of a picture of what Australian killer whales are like, how hard they are to study, and how difficult it is for us to, to get more and more information on them, which is really important if we want to understand them and protect them. The, the photographs that we gather are donated to us by people just like yourselves who are out at sea and lucky enough to see killer whales. You'll see so many names on so many different photographs. Very few of them um, have, and any of them that don't have a name on them, just assume that they were taken by myself or my colleagues in our group, except for this one that is here right now, which was taken by Mr. Kelvin Aitken from Melbourne. Uh, this photo was taken at a place called Port Phillip Heads in the Rip, the bottom of Port Phillip Bay. And this particular killer whale was attacking a shark with split fin. Um, so we couldn't get his name on the slide because this was a very late addition to our presentation because we thought you guys might like to hear what killer whales sound like when they're communicating. And this is what they sound like. <laughs> Okay, so what you heard there was a whole lot of whistles and squeals, and if you listened carefully, you would have heard a quick buzz. Now, they're the most commonly used um, uh, acoustic signals that we hear. Those are called uh, the whistles and burst pulses. The clicks were called burst pulses. Um, now, they're typically associated with social stuff. So that's animals talking to each other. And that means that they're telling each other information about themselves, perhaps coordinating a behaviour. 
There's another sound they make, which is called echolocation, which all dolphins use to navigate and perhaps find food. Now that recording there was made in Bremer Bay, um, and we, we quickly grabbed that off the internet today, but it happens to be take, recorded by my colleague, Rebecca Wellard, who works uh, and runs her own project called Project Orca. So look her up on Facebook as well, um, where you can find a whole lot of great photos and information on how whales, killer whales talk. We might even get her on as a guest one day to talk about killer whale acoustics. Um, but it's interesting to note that killer whales across the planet um, have different sounds that they make. We call it dialect, and it's generally separated by where the animals live and also perhaps even what families they belong to. So to say um, a West Australian killer whale, could it communicate with an East Australian killer whale? Possibly not, but we need to know the, the answer to that. So Dave, what's this photograph? That's a fish. <laughs> <laughs> Now, to be perfectly uh, honest and accurate, that fish is called uh, locally a blue nose or a blue eye traveller. Um, they're a fish that is regularly caught by fishermen off our coastline using a, a method called long lining, uh, drop lines. And they also happen to be a very, very tasty fish for killer whales. So if you have a look on the fish's scale there, you can see um, a couple of lines going from the dorsal fin on the back of the animal going down to its belly. Now those two lines, or you can see there's actually more than two, but those two prominent ones are caused by killer whales. Killer whales, although they're quite large in their size, will eat almost anything that they, almost anything that they like, I guess is the best way to answer it. And that includes things like very small squid, small fish like this, the blue eye traveller. Um, they'll take them from fishing lines, but they may also eat things like the next slide which is a sunfish. And just for your information, that killer whale there with the sunfish in its mouth is Ripley. Um, and remember Ripley from the photographs earlier. So Ripley was photographed in 2005 eating sunfish in New South Wales. And he was also photographed in 2013 eating uh, sunfish in Southern Tasmania. He gets around, He's a, he likes to wander around this big guy. And um, these sunfish are about as big as I, uh the back of a small car, aren't they? Yeah, sunfish can get very, very large. Um, you can see their fins span up to about three metres. They're very, very big fish. They, they're not always big, of course, but when they get big, they certainly get big and they can do a lot of damage to boats. So um, Dave, let's let's move through these quickly because there's heaps of questions that we need to get back to. So, Oh, I can see them piling up. Thank what, you, guys. What's happened to this whale? What on earth has caused all those things on its back? Well, what you can see there is more of what we saw in that little fish earlier. That's what we call killer whale rakings. They're caused by the teeth of the killer whale. Um, and when they're attacking prey, they leave these marks. Uh, and sometimes animals survive and sometimes they don't. In this case, this great photo taken by Isabella, who's with us today. Um, Isabella is based at Flinders University. She took this photo at um, off Bremer Bay in Western Australia. And unfortunately for this particular blue whale, this blue whale was over 20 metres long, or around about 20 metres long, if I remember correctly. Um, and unfortunately, this animal died because of the killer whale. But sometimes, and there was about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Isabella, but I, I believe it was about 30 or 40 killer whales. Are you, can I see you nodding? Yeah, she's got her hand to her head. Um, not if it's 40. <laughs> So they work, they work together. Higher, higher, right. higher number than that. I can't remember the exact number. So they work together. Again, working together, relying on each other. Now, as, as bad as that story was for the blue whale, sometimes whales get away. And in, in fact, in most cases, the large whales get away. And this humpback whale, as you can see, has what we call the remnant scarring of killer whales attacking this animal. Um, this photo was taken in Queensland by myself during work on, on, on humpback whales. And the good story here is that with resilience, you get to survive. And in the background there, you can see that this animal had a little calf with her traveling happily down the coast. So she survived the attack of the killer whales, just a vicious attack, but we're pleased to say that she's, uh, she's done well. And more photos of this particular whale have helped us to understand that she's doing quite well all the way through to the future. Um, okay. I hope that she's still around. So let's let's get back to our questions, Dave, and I'll try and figure out where we got to last time there. 
Um, but, oh boy, how do we tell the difference between a male and a female kilowale? Um, there's a few ways you can tell the difference. Um, the first Give us way, one quick one. <laughs> uh, one quick one. Well, the big dorsal fin, like you see in the photo here, that's an adult male. The girl's dorsal fin at adult size is more curved, like a typical dolphin, and just, but just bigger. Do we know why they have a white spot on their head? Oh, okay. That's called the eye patch. And we use the eye patch to identify individuals combined with the dorsal fin and, and the uh, saddle, which is, which is the gray area behind the dorsal fin. Why they have the white patch? I guess no one will ever properly know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, um, but certainly it, it's the individual between animals. So no two killer whales have the same eye patch. Mike, maybe that's one of the few ways that the animals can tell a difference between each other. Visually, that could be the yeah. case, and they can certainly tell each other from the, the way they speak or the way they communicate using acoustics. Too. Okay, so, and look, if anybody needs to, to go and have their, their afternoon tea or whatnot, please feel free to do so, but we'll be as quick as we can to get through these. Um, let's go down the list here. Well, we talked about the scratches on the killer whales, the best thing you wanted to know about. Um, why did we? Why did you name him Scar, Dave? That was probably a pretty easy one to answer. Yeah, so he's very heavily scarred. So he, we, we think that he's a very dominant animal, and he, he seems to get into scuffles with other with other killer whales, probably other males. And those scars that you see you saw on his body were caused by another killer whale's teeth. Um, they don't have hands like we do to push others away or to to fight with. So it's mouths and big teeth. Uh, and he's got quite a few battle scars, so that's why he got his name. And Eva's asked a question, what are the distant relatives of killer whales? And I, I might start by answering that in the sense to say that we are, because they're mammals just like us. And so that means that the babies feed on milk, and, and so they're, they're mammals like all the other critters in the sea. Oh, sorry, not like all the other critters in the sea. Hang on, there's a few people coming in. Dave, what about the killer whales communication we heard their sounds um what do you do you want to say anything more about their communication uh, well just that so far there's been three main ways that these animals um make sound echo location burst pulse and uh, also the whistles that we heard earlier the communication between animals is usually associated with the burst pulses and the whistles um, and those whistles can be unique to family groups or geographic populations um, in fact, they are unique uh, across geographic populations. And, uh, and how far can kill whales talk to each other from in the water? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it wouldn't be very far because of the frequency of the calls and it becomes an even shorter distance the more sound that we put in the water. So killer whales, like, our, like other whales and dolphins, they see with sound. And the more sound that we put in the water, with ships and other activities, um, the harder it is for killer whales and wh other whales and dolphins to communicate, which makes it really hard for them to survive. So we've got to be a bit careful about what we do in our oceans. And when there are big storms too, how deep storms. does a killer whale go, Dave? How deep? Was that the yeah, question? how deep? Um, so one tag, so the, one way to study killer whales or other whales and dolphins is to put tags on them. And some of those tags can measure depth when animals are diving. Now, one tag that I'm aware of was deployed on a killer whale and that killer whale dived to around 800 metres. I would have thought that's probably pretty close to their limits because previously it was much shallower. I think the, the theory was about 300, but that particular whale dived to 800 metres. I don't and, expect that the dive was very long though. <laughs> and thanks, Isabella, for how long do they live for? About 50 years? Uh, Isabella, I think that was 50 animals that was attacking the blue whale. Oh, okay. So, sorry, that was the wrong one. So, okay, well, maybe then we'll ask how, how many years? Uh, so, we, we think that it's similar to humans, um, perhaps up to 90 years or so. Um, there's certainly some evidence to help us understand that. So, they're quite long-lived, um, similar to human beings. Okay. And do they sleep with one eye open like dolphins? And then there's another one after this about sleeping. Do they sleep on the bottom of the sea or float on the top? So... <laughs> I sleep with one eye open. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's actually half their brain. So one side of their brain open or active and the other side sleeping. 
The reason for that is they've got to remember to come to the surface to breathe. So yes, they could sleep on the bottom, but they probably sleep closer to the surface. In fact, some, a lot of dolphins do sleep at the surface um, with half their brain shut off. But just remember that the important thing to remember there is they don't, they don't breathe automatically like we do in our sleep. They've got to remember to breathe to go to that surface. So um, that's one of the very funky adaptations of marine mammals that they can actually live their whole life in the ocean, but it comes with a few problems. You've got to remember to go to the surface. <laughs> okay, so what other ones? Do they ever attack humans, Dave? Yes, they do. But here's the kicker, only in captivity. Now, there's been a, a few anecdotal reports of killer whales being aggressive towards people um, in the oceans, but no evidence. But we all know what's happened to people in captivity in places like SeaWorld in, in the US, where even some people sadly died because of killer whale attacks. So um, our experience at sea is that they are very shy of people in the water. They are not very curious at all, and they certainly haven't shown any aggression. Um, I have worked in the water with killer whales, and we've never seen that happen. Uh, before. So they're actually quite a shy animal considering they are the top predator in the ocean. Okay, so I'll just pick some of these last ones and are they endangered? And that's probably a really good one to sort of help wrap up, Dave. That's a great question. The simple answer is in Australia, we don't know. We don't know enough about killer whales in Australia. We literally are scratching the surface of understanding them, particularly on the East Coast. Um, we don't have a population estimate for killer whales in Australia, so therefore we can't say. They fall under what we call, or what the government calls data deficient. Now, data deficient means we don't have enough information. That's why myself and others, including Project Orca and Flinders University and the University of Tasmania are all working together to help understand what our killer whales look like in Australia, who they are, how many they are, and how can we protect them? That's the simple, Ballpark answer, um, and it's another way of saying we don't know, but we're trying to find out. And that's such a very common story about so much in the marine environment. And Dave, we just had Beck, Beck Weller join us. So Beck, thank you. We used some of your sounds that we found through um, in an earlier part of the presentation. So hello. <laughs> Yes, hi Beck. So we'd love to have you come on one time, Beck, to come and talk about killer whale sounds sometime. So would anybody be interested in hearing a presentation from Beck on how killer whales talk? A big yes or a no? So we're yes. getting more some. Yes. 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 Now, yes. The yes. 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 Uh, yes. 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 The important Please. thing is we yeah. need to know if Beck would be happy to come and talk to us about killer whales and how they speak. Would you be interested, Beck? Oh, she's gone. Wait, hang on, I'm going to find her and unmute her. Can you find <laughs> her somewhere? So, yes, uh, as Jeff said, the, 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 the sounds we used earlier, um, we, we oh. grabbed off the internet. Um, they were supplied by Rebecca and, and her project um, for some work she'd been doing. Um, so as we said, it's last minute, dropped it in there, and I hope everyone enjoyed it, but it's opened the gate for a new conversation, which is what we're always trying to do, is to see if people can, we can generate more interest in what we do to help us understand these animals. And the more we can communicate that to you, the better it is for us, which is, and the better that is for the animals. The more work we can do to help protect them, um, it, it, the better it is. So I'm hoping that Beck will agree to come on sometime and give us a talk on, on killer whale acoustics. Okay, so you can twist her arm, Dave. So look, I think it's probably time we need to pull this, um, call this to uh, an end. So thank you so much for everybody for joining us. Um, there are a few other questions um, coming in and Beck has actually sent a a chat response she's having problems with her audio to say yes so we can we can do that another time as well excellent so, thank you beck i'll make sure we get everybody back to hear you talk about um killer whales i can see what a killer whale is hunted by and Pretty i much. think i think david would be good also to hear about the journey that beck's taken to get where she is as well and and that's probably a good conversation as well that we need to have so look thank yeah, you everybody yeah, we're very lucky and guys, for those of you who are interested in the sort of work that we do, 
the story that we can we can share with you about Beck's journey and my journey and and the journey of the Dolphin Research Institute may help you understand um, how you might be able to follow your dreams and work in this area as well because it is um, all about being a nice person and working together. <laughs> On that note, Dave, I think um, if, if anybody happens to see any dolphins or whales, once we're let out of captivity ourselves, um, please go on to our website and report them. That would be fantastic. And uh, when it gets closer to the whale season, we'll do a, um, a talk about the Two Whales Whale Project specifically. And um, we'll keep everybody updated about the whales because they're not that far away. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of thanks coming on the screen here for Becca Green to talk. So you're locked in now, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so thank you all. We might um, say goodbye, have a lovely weekend, and um, yeah, enjoy captivity. Absolutely, everybody. Stay safe, do as they say, and we can get out of here sooner rather than later. Thank you so much. We look forward to chatting to you again next time. Bye-bye.